Good afternoon. Afternoon, everybody. I'm the, I'm the college president, so it's a very great pleasure and privilege to be able to welcome everyone uh, to this event. Everyone here in the, the room and also everyone watching us on, on the live streamed uh, filming from all around the, the world. We are Oxford's most international college, so we always have a, a lot of our current students who are um, studying part-time and, and living in, in uh, countries across the world. So, welcome. This event is organised jointly with the Oxford International Biomedical Centre, so it's a very great pleasure to be able to um, invite the president of the Oxford International Biomedical Centre to say a few words. Charles. Yes, well, thank you very much, Jonathan. Well, Anne McLaren was a long-time supporter and indeed trustee of the Oxford International Biomedical Centre. And you may ask why. Well, because I think her ambition, her aims, was very similar to ours. We are a non-for-profit organization, and our main aim is to enthuse more youngsters into science. Uh, and we do this through a number of what we call scientists in schools, where dis distinguished researchers, from actually from professor down to postdoc, come and talk to a school about their research very much person-to-person -person, uh, interaction, and that works very well. We focus mainly on state and state schools and academies, but uh, we also have links with some independent schools who then act as host and invite neighboring schools to the event. So we're very grateful to Jonathan uh, for his hospitality here and hosting this event which we've been doing for a number of years, uh, almost since 16 years ago, but the first few years, I think, were somewhere else. Anyway, um, I'm sure that this conf not like a conference, but whatever it is, a seminar or a Panel. symposium uh, <laughs> on uh, women in science, uh, women in science research and policy, is very topical, especially as I note that tinkering with human genes in human embryos has now come back into focus. It was first done in China two or three years ago and condemned by everybody, but is, is creeping back again, so be interested what you have to say. Well, anyway, it's now my great pleasure to introduce your chair lady, um, Dr. Helena, uh, um, uh, sorry, I've forgotten. Uh, 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 yes, yes, sorry. Very Spanish. Yeah. Um, Caro, I'm sorry, terribly sorry. Anyway, and she is a junior research fellow of this college and also a member of the Department of Physiology, Anatomy and Genetics at this university. So, Helena, yours. Thank you very much, Ralph. Thank you very much. It's an absolute honor to be here today, to be in the Anne McLaren Memorial Lecture. And this event today is actually to, hopefully, will let us know a little more about these fascinating scientists in the field of reproduction and regeneration, and about her work, her life, and especially focusing on research and a science policy. For that, we actually count with a panel of four outstanding female academics, as you can see here. And I'm just gonna introduce them a little. So starting farther away from me is Professor Sarah Franklin. She's the chair in sociology at the University of Cambridge, where she established and direct the leading center of reproductive sociology and research group. Her research centers around the social implication of reproduction, touching themes like what's been the impact of IBH in society on the current gender and kinship perspective. She's also the chair of the Anne McLaren Trust. Then just near her, we can find Professor Emily Jackson. 
She is a professor of law at LSE, a member of the British Medical Association and Medical Ethics Committee. And until 2012, she was actually the deputy chair of the Human Fertilization Embryology Authority. That's the organism that regulates assisted reproduction here in the UK. And her research focuses on the law and ethics related to areas like reproduction, but also like life decision making and pharmaceutical industry. Just near her, we can find, oh, sorry, we can find Professor Susan Mickey, that's actually the daughter of Anne McLaren. And she is also a professor of health psychology and director of the Center for Behavioral Change at UCL. Her work studies how human behavior changes depending on health and environment and how we can use this to actually induce positive change. And she's actually also the chair of the Behavioral Insights and Science Technical Advisory Group at the World Health Organization. And finally, just near me, we have Professor Dorothy Bishop. She is Emeritus Professor of the Developmental Neuropsychology and Wellcome Trans Principal Research Fellow at the Department of Experimental Psychology here at Oxford University. And her research focuses on understanding the nature and cases of language impairment children. Plus, she's also a strong advocate of open science and research reproducibility, and she's actually one of the founders of the Reproductive Research Oxford Network here. So just to start this panel, what we are going to do is to start with some short remarks about Anne McLaren's impact and the current situation of women scientists in research and policy. And we'll start with Professor Fugit, please. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much for that lovely introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here and to see all of you. And can I just um, start by asking how many people have any familiarity with Anne McLaren and the work she did? Just put your hand up. Yeah, so many of you maybe don't really know anything at all about Anne McLaren, although I think you can probably guess you know, from some of the things that have been said already. So I'll, I'll just say a little bit first about you know, why uh, she is such an important figure to all of us. And, um, and to many people in fields far beyond her own field of reproductive biology. Um, I'm an anthropologist, um, so I'm not someone who might have expected to get um, particularly excellent instruction from Anne McLaren, but I did. Um, and that's a very typical experience, and it had a very lasting effect on me. So I'm very pleased to be able to be here and say a little bit about that. Um, she was, of course, a biologist, um, although she did want to have a career in English, in literature, um, and as a child had very limited schooling due to the war, and therefore when she went to, um, to prepare for the examinations to come to Oxford, she was a little bit concerned that there was no way she could really catch up with what she'd missed in literature, but having grown up with a uh, number of people involved in gardening and raising poultry and various things around um, the large estate she lived on during the war in Wales, um, she found that the biology exam looked relatively straightforward. Um, so she decided she would do that, and sure enough, um, she quickly became a very accomplished biologist, uh, about which I'll say a bit more in a minute. But she was also really, from the very beginning, a kind of ambassador for her field, um, someone who could communicate about quite complex uh, scientific problems and issues, including the ethical dimensions of issues, to a wide and varied audience. She was a superb communicator. So, so maybe, in a way, she did achieve a kind of literary career <laughs> in the end. Um, she uh, was also very involved in policy, in forming policy, particularly about highly controversial issues related to her field, research on human embryos, in vitro fertilization, um, questions about modification of heredity, issues around which people not only have very conflicted opinions and views, but, but often issues around which people have very strong feelings. So often issues where it can be quite difficult to achieve an effective kind of um, translation. And she, she was very, very good at that, very, very good at communicating about her field as well. Um, so she was also um, a very distinguished scientist. 
Um, it would take a lot longer than 10 minutes to, to name the number of things she contributed to basic science, um, particularly about the very earliest stages of uh, human development. And she was the first woman to hold office in the Royal Society. She was the first woman to hold official office in the Royal Society in its entire history. And she did that as the Foreign Secretary of the Royal Society, in which she played a key role building international alliances amongst scientists to work on key issues related to heredity, key practical issues related to heredity, related to animal breeding and crop um, breeding, as well as um, medical applications and other, other um, areas of basic scientific research. Um, so she was really unusually very, very broad in the number of things that she did. Um, so for me, really, the sort of short version of the shortest possible version of summarizing her contribution in 10 minutes or less um, is, is a single word, which is translation. She, she was really someone who understood the translational aspects of science in their full breadth. Um, it, it wasn't until around the turn of the century that the word translation began to be used for science in a widespread way and in particular the adjective translational for science that would cross from basic scientific research into some kind of application. So translational really became the term to refer to applied um, science. Um, but what it also meant was communicating about science to a wider audience in order for the benefits of science to become more widely available because in effect if you have some kind of innovation but people don't really understand it or they don't feel comfortable with it or they don't really accept it, it's not going to benefit anybody. But it's not easy necessarily to talk to people about a scientific innovation that makes them feel uncomfortable. You, you really have to understand how to enable people to express their concerns, express their doubts express their opposition even in order to enable people to trust in the science more fully. And trust is a very important word because trust isn't just something people think. You know, trust is something people feel. And she had a feeling for how to do that. She had a feeling for how to do that in part because she had a lot of trust in the public. Um, it was an example she set that is, of course, now particularly important because a lot of the issues she was working on, like IVF and human embryo research, were really comparatively niche areas when she began working on them, especially in the 1950s when she was working on IVF in mice. Um, and um, you know, even in the 1970s and the 1980s, when she got more involved in policy, very, very few people were actually directly involved with either human embryo research or IVF. So um, her innovations in that area have become increasingly important. And one of the most important innovations she made in relation to the translation of science was, as I say, in policy. She was instrumental in passing the British Human Fertilization and Embryology Act, which my colleague Emily will say more about. And I have the great privilege of writing a book with Emily at the moment about the cornerstone of the Human Fertilization and Embryology Act, which is the so-called 14-day rule that puts a limit on how long you can do research on human embryos. And this limit really became a kind of symbol for the role of law in relation to this area, that the, that the law could set a kind of a limit, a kind of a barrier, and that in exchange for controlling this area of science, it could be allowed to pursue highly controversial areas such as research on the very earliest stages of human life. Um, I don't think still the impact of the HFEA and the 14-day rule is, is as appreciated as it will be in time. I don't think it's any exaggeration to say it's one of the most impactful policy platforms of the 20th century because it, it set a precedent, a precedent that is yet actually to be matched by any other country, of enabling much greater public trust in highly controversial biomedical research by giving a permissive but strict approach 
to regulating it. Um, so that's obviously incredibly relevant now in relation to what Charles was saying about CRISPR, using gene editing on human embryos and so forth. But um, in addition to practical translational techniques such as IVF that Anne helped to develop, um, translational policy, which she helped to develop, she was also, she is still, I think, underestimated in terms of the impact of her ability to translate basic science into new concepts. When she developed IVF, she didn't develop it for use as a clinical technology. She developed it as a research technique to understand heredity, and in particular to understand how the reproductive body of the, the maternal body, the what you call the uterine effect, changes genetic transmission. Of course, this kind of flew in the face of the idea that genetic transmission is entirely independent of any physical um, uh, communication with, with, with an individual body. Um, and, and she showed that wasn't true. And she thus helped to usher in a completely new concept of heredity, now called epigenetics, that has in fact become the dominant paradigm in, in developmental biology, which is a huge, huge accomplishment, which she did through another form of translation, which we might call experimental translation, because she was very, very innovative, very confident um, in being able to take an extremely complex problem and translate it into a set of experimental steps that would come up with a neat and definite outcome, which I'm sure all of you who are involved in experimental research, if you are, can appreciate is much more difficult than it seems. Um, and the way she did that was to combine um, the use of studying um, embryos that had been in the body of one mouse that were moved to complete their gestation in the body of another mouse on a sufficient scale that she could draw on her husband, Donald Mickey's exceptional statistical knowledge to determine whether there was a discernible effect of the gestation in the second body that changed the embryo from what it had been beforehand. And so it was very laborious. She had to breed her own strains of mice. She had to develop techniques that had never been used experimentally. She had to combine them with what we might call computational biology. And to do that, she had to be very attentive to the mouse reproductive cycle, which let's not forget is not only very small, but nocturnal. So I was really pleased we chose this picture for our event tonight because, you know, we don't really know how much she slept, you know, the night before she had the mouse on her typewriter. But to do these experiments from 1952 onward, the postdoctoral work she did, um, to, to make these discoveries, you know, she really had to be incredibly inventive. So finally, she then had to translate these basic scientific uh, discoveries into clinical applications. Um, she was one of the first people to really work out how to do pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, how to use the embryo when it's outside the body to test it to see if it tests positive for a known mutation in her case, she started with thalassemia, um, and she worked with colleagues at UCL and um, the um, Institute for Child Health to, to help to develop the very, very first scans that were used for human pre-implantation gen genetic diagnosis. So um, all of these um, translational gifts, you know, together um, are, are quite extraordinary, and, and they're particularly relevant today when there are so many very, very important biomedical um, researches on, on very controversial areas such as editing the, the human embryo and um, using reproductive material from several different people, um, even using animal material. You know, th these will continue to be very emotive, you know, as well as very ethically challenging areas. So the ability to do the research, to see the implication of the research, to communicate about that, to develop frameworks of policy and ethics that can handle that is a model that is, if anything, even more 
important today than when when she um, when she did her work. And when I met and as an anthropologist, I really didn't have much expectation that I would be able to talk to her very much because she was very busy, um, and because I'm not a scientist. <laughs> And because I wrote a book as a social scientist about PGD, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, and I thought, you know, well, I'll just see if she might help me a little bit, you know. And she took the manuscript. She read the entire manuscript. She made notes on the manuscript. And when I went to talk to her about it, she actually told me she thought I'd more or less gotten the whole thing correct, which was astonishing. And she gave me some insights as to what else I could add into my book. And, you know, it's very, very rare that you have that kind of connection with a scientist, but it's because she could see, you know, she was really a visionary. She could really see if the value of the science is going to land, if it's going to be received, if it's going to have an impact, people need to be able to engage with it and understand it and communicate about it. So that's my more than 10 minute, um, a little bit more like 15 minutes, but it's a big question. <laughs> What did she contribute and why? So thank you very much. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Thank you so much to Jonathan for inviting me and it's a really huge honour um, to share this platform with this incredibly distinguished panel. So I met Anne uh, when I was a member of the Human Fertilisation and Embryology Authority, of which Anne was not only a founder member, but also, as we've heard, along with Mary Warnock, its key architect. Um, Anne's 10-year term on the authority itself, which was preceded by seven years on the Voluntary Licensing Authority, had ended when I joined in 2003. But Anne continued for the rest of her life to be a very great friend to the authority and it benefited hugely from what we've heard already from Sarah, her generosity with her time, her knowledge, her wisdom and her experience. The further away we get in time from the Warnock Committee's 1984 report, the more remarkable it seems to me. For a start, this was the early 1980s and um, many of us in this room can remember what the UK was like in the early 1980s. Some of you can't. But for those of us that can, it was definitely not a high point of feminism and progressiveness. And yet the Warnock Committee was dominated by two women, Mary and Anne, and the shape the report took and its recommendations, as well as its wonderfully crisp, brisk prose, is down to both of them. And their recommendations really have, as Sarah has said already, been remarkably successful, leading to a piece of legislation which has successfully regulated fertility treatment and embryo research in the UK for 32 years and counting. It's still going strong. So one of the things that seems really extraordinary, and I, I, I do find myself wondering what on earth was going on, is that it was the Thatcher government that was responsible for appointing this committee and letting it get on with its work. Um, and, and this is particularly remarkable given the amount of noise there was at the time about conservative traditional family values. So perhaps while there was a huge amount wrong with Thatcherism and its values, at least unlike some of the current lot, they hadn't had enough of experts because um, Anne very much was an expert. And as the expert developmental biologist on the committee, Anne played an absolutely crucial role in explaining the science to her fellow members. And as anyone who met her will confirm, she had the most remarkable ability to cut through waffle and to be clear, precise and persuasive. So Sarah's already mentioned the 14-day the limit, and this was the question of whether embryo research was legitimate at all, whether it should be done at all, was a central um, question for the Warnock Committee and, um, and reverberated around Parliament in the years following that. Um, in relation to that question, Anne recognised the importance of finding some sort of landmark in embryological development which could serve as a red line beyond which scientists would not be allowed to go in order to reassure the public. But in order to be reassuring, it had to be easy to understand. So the 14-day limit, as Sarah said, the cornerstone of the regulation of embryo research in the UK, widely copied worldwide, could be explained and justified using concepts that everyone can follow. Um, so the reason for choosing 14 days, summed up by uh, Anne herself, with Carol, oh, sorry, I've, I've done something to this. 
the screen, I'm sorry about that. Uh, she summed it up with characteristic clarity. If I had to point to a stage and say, this is when I began being me, I would think it would have to be here. Um, and in an interview published in Human Fertility that Jane Dent Denton, who was also an authority member, did with Anne in 2004, she asked Anne about her involvement in the regulation of IVF. And I think Anne's answer is wonderfully revealing. So Anne said that in the 1950s, when she was doing embryo transfers in mice, she realised that this technology we had in mice would probably eventually be applied to women too. And then she went on to say this, I was very keen that when in vitro fertilisation or embryo transfer or whatever was successfully developed in women, it should get a good press, as it were, and that women should realise that this was potentially beneficial for them and not be scared and suspicious of a new strange technique. And I suppose one realised eventually that it was more likely to be so when it was regulated. So regulation to Anne was a way to enable people to see the benefits of science and not be scared of it. Anne, as Sarah's mentioned this already, but Anne was also way ahead of her time in seeing the value of public consultation. So in this same interview with um, Jane Denton, Jane asked her if the HFEA should consult more widely on issues like tissue typing, which was a big issue um, in the press then, selecting an embryo to be a good tissue match for an older sibling. Um, and Anne's answer was simply, yes, I think the more consultation, the better, with no qualifications at all. And Jane went on in this interview to ask Anne about public education on genetics. And, and Anne corrected her. She said, it isn't just public education. It's really public discussion, because I actually think the public understand a lot more about genetics than they're given credit for, although they might not know the right words. Now, in addition to her membership of the Warnock Committee and of the HFEA, Anne played a key role in many other bodies, including the Nuffield Council on Bioethics and the group of advisors to the European Commission on the Ethical Implications of Biotechnology. And she continued um, throughout her life to make really sharp, incisive interventions on new scientific developments. So following the birth, uh, the announcement in 1998 of the birth of Dolly the sheep uh, a year earlier, Anne was the lead rapporteur of the European Commission's group um, opinion on the ethical aspects of cloning techniques. And her commentary is very short and it's really marvellous because it starts with Humpty Dumpty um, from Alice in Wonderland. When I use a word, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. So, um, excuse me, I've done the same thing again. I don't know what, I, so I escape out of it. Sorry about this. Can I do anything to make it full screen? Should I just leave it? Okay. So on the meaning of the word clone, Anne said, I'm, I was saying identical twins are clones. Um, and so of the argument that is sometimes made that the unique identity of human beings must be protected, Anne said, again, in this really wonderfully brisk way she had, if we do not wish to impugn the unique identity of each monozygotic twin, it is hard to base a convincing argument against cloning on this concept. Four years later, uh, Anne coordinated the production of a Council of Europe publication called Simply Cloning. And her introduction started by disarmingly domesticating the subject. And the first sentence um, of her introduction was, those of us who are keen gardeners are frequently making clones by taking cuttings, layering, dividing corms, or any other method of vegetable propagation. And her introduction ended again on a theme that recurs in her work by saying, along the lines of, as Sarah pointed out, science is for everyone. The last sentence was, cloning isn't just reserved for scientists. It has significant implications in many different ways for each one of us. So while at first sight, I think it is a real puzzle that under the Thatcher government, the UK passed legislation to regulate fertility treatment and embryo research, which is both empathetic and permissive. The explanation, I think, does lie in the appointment of two absolutely remarkable women, Mary Warnock and Anne McLaren, who demonstrated that intellectual brilliance could be accompanied by kindness and compassion, and who recognised the importance of just getting things done. Anne changed the face of the regulation of human fertilisation and embryology, and I think it's a testament to quite how extraordinary she was that both scientists worldwide, as well as millions of families, owe her a huge debt of gratitude. I'll stop there. That seems rather blank. Oh. Oh.
Great. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. I'm uh, Susan Mickey and I'm one of three of Anne's children who are all here today. Uh, Jonathan's my younger brother and Caroline sitting over here, my younger sister, and my two daughters, Jessica and Laura, sitting behind. So it's great to have um, all Anne's first and generation um, offspring here. I want to start um, with a quote that Anne made on a in a radio interview, uh, which was, had I been a better scientist, I would have been a less good mother. Had I been a better mother, I would have been a less good scientist. And I think that really sums up the uh, predicament that a lot of um, scientists who are women, women who are scientists, find themselves in. Um, and we grew up in a, in a in a, a situation where science and um, family life kind of merged into each other. Um, so I think the earliest story that I remember about lab life was apparently uh, when I was able to crawl. Um, I think it was mainly my father, but I think both, both uh, Donald and Dan um, used Skinnerian principles uh, to teach me how to crawl to a white lab coat on the floor to go to sleep. Uh, so they trained me so they could get on with their work at the weekends. Um, I, I went on from there to uh, our Sundays, our Sunday mornings were always spent. Some people go to church, ours were always spent in Anne's lab. And uh, all three of us have many memories, uh, which I won't go into. But um, one of the things I definitely took away is that um, I, I was the elder, so I was put in charge of um, writing meticulous entries into her lab book about what was going on with different symbols and different colours and numbers and coding. And I find it fascinating that you could um, sum up the lives of these um, poor mice, as I saw them, um, in all this coding in a, in a, a lab book. And my own um, scientific work, I think, has really benefited from that. She also never lost an opportunity to um, bring science into whatever we were doing uh, around us. And she was very keen on the experimental technique. And I remember one time uh, we set up an experiment, which a very simple experiment, uh, which was a saucer full of uh, brine um, on the basis that, amazingly, this transparent liquid, when all the water evaporated, would leave salt. So we waited and we waited and we waited and the, the water went. But there was nothing there at the end of it. There was no salt. Um, but rather than discovering something really new, uh, we later found out that Jonathan had drank all the water because he <laughs> liked salty water. Um, I, I'll fast forward to um, really towards the end of her life in her late 80s. Um, I was absolutely delighted to go on two foreign trips with her. She was a great believer in um, uh, taking, taking her children um, to situations where other people took partners. So actually, our early years, we all took it in turn to go to different uh, foreign countries with her. And the first I went to actually was in Venice um, in, the, in the days when they had WISE programmes. So uh, there were all the male scientists and the WISE went along and I went on the WISE programme. And uh, I do remember meeting um, Pincus, Dr. Pincus, who invented the pill uh, back, back in those days. Um, but the last two trips I went, uh, with her was um, to India, where she went to visit, um, gave talks uh, in three different places around India, and um, then to Japan. Um, and I think one of the things that uh, really impressed me there that I hadn't known about her, you know, you can know someone really well. I didn't know quite how well she prepared. I mean, I knew she had a terrible memory, like I do, but I didn't realize how much she prepared for events so um, after these uh, events, her lectures, of course, there were receptions. And she got the list of names of everybody at these events. She'd go through them in advance and she wrote notes against lots and lots of names. And she'd say, ah, I want to introduce this person to this person because I think that this person could be helpful to her or I, I want to do this or I want to do that. And so she had a whole plan of action before every social event she went into. What was very striking, that plan of action was all about helping other people. And I thought that was just remarkable. Um, in India, she was, um, you could tell she was incredibly committed to helping people from the global south. 
You know, she was making connections, she was supporting them, she was giving information, thinking of ways in which she could help the scientists in the global south. Um, often really drawn to young people and to women, you know, recognising that um, extra enablement uh, was helpful. Um, when she became Foreign Secretary of the Royal Society, uh, one of the first things she did uh, was to establish um, international links and a, a memorandum of understanding with Cuba, which as a socialist all her life was a country she really admired. Um, in Japan, the reason she went to Japan was to accept, accept something called the Japan Prize, which was a sort of Eastern equivalent of the Nobel Prize. And um, the, at the same time, uh, Tim Berners-Lee, uh, who invented the internet, uh, do you invent the internet? whatever you do to, to get the internet going, was there also. Um, and Jonathan happened to be on a scientific uh, visit in Japan. So uh, we had a delightful time spending time with um, Tim and, and my mother. And um, she used her acceptance speech um, in a typically brave and bold way for Japan, which was to be very outspoken about the huge waste for Japan of not encouraging women scientists more. And again, very diplomatically put, you know, it didn't come over as a, a, you know, a feminist kind of message or anything, but just what a waste for this country that you're not using uh, women more than you are. And, and afterwards, so many women came up to her and really thanked her because it was a, a big deal. For her. It was in front of the emperor and the empress and the prime minister. And, you know, it's a big deal to have had that uh, message given over. And I just want to uh, say a few things personally about Anne and the things that I have really, um, really taken away from all the time I, I spent with her. I mean, one of the things um, was she absolutely loved life and was never daunted by a challenge. You know, challenges were really opportunities, either in her personal or pro professional life. And she always had um, unbounded optimism and a kind of can-do attitude. Uh, a sort of glass half full person, which was quite literal actually, because she did like a good party, uh, was usually first up on dance floor at uh, events. Um, I remember at the event um, shortly after Anne died that we, we held for all her friends and colleagues to come together. Um, Professor Jim Smith, who now heads science at the Wellcome Trust, um, spoke and uh, recalled one day that I uh, summed her up in a way um, to him, which was a Saturday. And he bumped into her randomly twice in that one day. The first was um, at Camden Tube Station, where she was selling copies of the Morning Star, a socialist daily newspaper. And then later on uh, that afternoon or evening, um, where she was queuing for Bob Dylan tickets. Um, the other thing about Anne, and um, it's, it's been sort of mentioned really, is, is um, uh, and I want to bring it out more, it's a, a real strong moral compass and a, a very, very strong sense of social justice, uh, both in terms of the UK, but also globally. Um, she, every, every time there was an election, uh, we grew up in Edinburgh, she would um, take us out of school. I mean, certainly I remember me being taken out of school and um, we'd drive round in the car to pick up pick up um, people who needed driving to the polling station. You don't have to guess what party that she was supporting. Um, and that was an incredibly um, politicising experience for me because it was the first time that I'd gone into the really disadvantaged, impoverished outskirts of Edinburgh and saw the conditions that people were living in. I mean, absolutely terrible, you know, going into people's um, flats and seeing what was going on. And I vividly remember um, my first demonstrations uh, with Anne as a child uh, against the Vietnam War. Um, oh yes, sorry, I just added something. And I did want to say this also, um, which again, I suppose speaks to her um, political and Marxist outlook. Um, when I was doing my PhD here in Oxford, which is on developmental psychologists, I got psychology I got very interested in dialectical philosophy and um, in, in terms of human development, uh, not preconception, but after, um, and read a lot about dialectical materialism, which 
I find an incredibly unifying philosophical framework. It just made total sense of so many things that I'd thought about or ways of thinking. And I remember saying to Anne, you know, this is incredible. You know, why don't, why don't we get taught about this at school? Why don't people know about it? Um, because, you know, the, it just seems so important to tools of thought. And she said, well, you know, any really good scientist is a dialectical materialist. It's just they don't know about it. Um, as has been said, I mean, Anne was a, a great believer in science for the common good and uh, felt that it was the responsibility of all scientists to communicate their science to the public and to all those who could benefit from it. After Anne died, I was astounded by the <clears throat> hundreds of people who sent letters and emails from all over the world about um, and with stories, really moving stories, whose lives she'd obviously touched and they'd remembered, you know, things that she'd done, just sort of small or large kindnesses. And I think the word kind was mentioned before. Um, you know, th there was nothing she wouldn't do for you, although she didn't suffer fools gladly either. So you, ha you had to be um, in the, the category of, uh, but it was a very, very wide category uh, where she's very generous with her, her time. Um, and finally, I just want to say one of the many things I learned from Anne is the importance of um, seizing the moment and that you don't have to choose between a successful career or a fun-filled family and social life or, bet or between political activity. You can combine all of these things. And um, those who knew Anne will remember how unassuming and modest she was, although she was also very determined to fight for what she believed in and for a better world. And I think that um, combination of humility, kindness and determin determination is one of the reasons she was a great role model for everyone. I mean, for young people, for women, but for everyone. And one of the reasons she continues to be so to this day. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, as they say on Monty Python, now for something completely different, um, in the sense that I knew of Anne, of course, but I didn't know Anne. And I'm going to, after this wonderfully upbeat account of a woman in science who was in, clearly inspirational to those who knew her, I'm going to talk about some negative aspects that I think we have to really worry about in the contemporary world as far as women in science are concerned. Um, my own history, I'm going to be relentlessly anecdotal, I'm afraid, but um, my own history was initially looking very unremarkable. As a child, I thought I had an unremarkable childhood in the sense that I grew up in Ilford in Essex. My father was a furniture dealer, my mother was a secretary, and we trundled along. Only every Christmas, there was this sudden uh, outburst of the lady on the left, Margaret Oiken, who would visit us. She, um, as you see, was a scientist. She's wearing a white coat, has to be a scientist. Um, and she was my mother's sister. And at this point, when we had these visits, I started to realize that my family did have some rather strange characteristics. And one was that my mother was, uh, the black sheep of her family was completely dissociated from them. They were in Germany. She had been a naughty girl, she'd got pregnant, this was all around the time of the war. She'd been even naughtier, she'd um, then subsequently, at the end of the war, been a translator for the British occupying forces and married my father, uh, who, was, uh, who took her back to Britain. And one can only imagine the circumstance of turning up in Britain with a German wife and a German-speaking illegitimate child. Um, but this, I was blissfully unaware of all of this, I had a very happy childhood. But Margaret Oiken uh, was clearly somebody who felt this wasn't really good enough for her nephews and nieces. And she was a really inspirational figure for us because she would turn up and she would bring books. She would spend time with us. She was extremely interested in everything we were doing. And only as we got older, myself and my brother and my, my sister, did we learn that her own history had been rather sad in the sense that her father was a professor of physical chemistry. She wanted to be an academic. She was told, no, you're a woman, you're not going to be an academic. And she ended up being an industrial chemist, and she resented that. 
What made it even more peculiar, though, was that in a funny way she took those attitudes and perpetuated them. She was still really promoting the idea that it's boys that go into science. Um, so although she was very fond of all of us, I was actually regarded as somebody who didn't really need to worry about too much, whereas my brother, they were very concerned, both her and my mother, with this emphasis on males in, you know, what happens to the men is the important thing in the world. And that was so odd, because her own career would have been perhaps rather different if people in her life had had a different view. So one of, if I have a theme, it's that quite often women themselves seem to be their own worst enemies. And I'm going to say a little bit more about myself in that regard. Um, well, I subsequently, somehow, my brother, of course, dropped out and went into a beat group. And my sister left school at 70. I sort of fertled it along. Nobody really cared what I was doing, but I managed to get into Oxford and have a scientific career. Uh, and this paper was a rather influential one in my history. Um, this was the days when there was, you couldn't search the literature for papers uh, on the computer, they didn't exist, so you had to go to the Radcliffe Science Library, these big tomes called Psychological Abstracts, um, and you would happen upon papers that were nothing to do with what you were interested in, and this was one of them that made a huge impact on me, because it was essentially a paper that showed that if you give the same uh, essay or scientific paper to groups of people to evaluate, and you either say it's by John somebody, or you say it's by Jane somebody, it's evaluated more negatively if it's by Jane. I have to say, as somebody now interested in reproducibility, I gather this line of research is not as solid as we all thought at the time, but I read this and it made a big impact on me. And it possibly made a difference to my career, because ever since then I decided I was going to be DVM bishop on my papers, not Dorothy. Whether this made a difference, I don't know. But one reason this paper spoke to me was that I had the horror of realising that I felt like that. That when I went and read the literature, if I was going to read a paper by Bloggs, and it turned up and Bloggs had a female name, I had a sense of disappointment. I thought it's not going to be as nerdy, it's not going to be, you know, it's gonna, it might be a bit fluffy because it's by a woman. I thought, what the hell, you know? <laughs> I don't think I'm fluffy. I hope I'm not. Um, you know, how is it that I have such a strong internalised view of women being just slightly not as, as impressive as men? Whether I inherited this from these, my mother and Margaret, I don't know. But I, I, have a, I had a sense that the, the fact that this was an article that was written about suggested that this is very much more widespread than we think, and there's something very deep, and one has to counteract that at every step. Um, so the pressures against women, I think, are not just coming from the patriarchy, although I think I'm going to have a bit to say about them as well. But I think they are also somehow deeply internalised. And as a psychologist, I'm very, very interested in this. So over the years, um, we heard about the Thatcher era and about the amazing uh, advances made by women then. Um, and over the years, in my own long career, I, like most of my generation, I think, were feeling up until perhaps about six or seven years ago that the arc of history was going in the right direction as far as equality, diversity and so on were concerned. There were moves to improve acceptance of a wide range of people. Women were given more and more opportunities. And there were things like the Athena Swan Charter explicitly set up in order to improve the loss of women in science. But then things seem to be unravelling. And I think many of us feel, looking at politics around us and so on, that this sense of security we had, of everything moving onward and upward to a, a better future, is under extreme threat. And I feel that this is affecting not just our general political situation, but I think that we have to be very, very worried to, that there may be things taken away uh, from us that we were already grasping. A note about Athena Swan is that it was evaluated um, a few years ago and it was recognised that although it was a scheme that was intended to improve the lot of women, it was having negative unintended consequences because who was it that was having to fill out these mighty surveys that you had to submit as part of your submission to get some sort of award from them? It was typically the women. And you could understand why. You, you would say, well, it's women we're trying to support. Should the men tell them how to be supported? No. But it, it, this was really quite a serious problem. And it, it's now been updated. And of course, 
with a pandemic, I don't know whether it's uh, still going as strong as it did, but it, it's a move in the right direction that I think is now under threat with the whole concern about culture wars and so on. And the threats are at many levels. They're at the big level and the small. At the small level, one can see in society increasing focus on emphasizing gender differences. And there's this wonderful uh, group of people who have a website called Let Toys Be Toys, who are documenting on social media the extent to which things that used to be gender neutral are now made gender specific in a way that's really detrimental to females. So you can buy a box full of boy stuff. And what has it got in it? It's got Lego, it's got space stuff, it's got secret weapons, something moldy. Um, girls have got unicorns, pinkness, sparkly, pink and fluffy. And the best one that they found was, has now got its own hashtag, gendered cheese, where they found that there were shops that were selling little bits of cheese wrapped differently and marketed differently for little boys and little girls. It's the same cheese. So there's this, pro you know, there's somehow this pressure in society to emphasize the differences and to emphasize very much that intellect is something that, and strength and ambition and exploration goes with boys. Girls have to be cute, sweet and fluffy. Of course, on the political, the larger stage, it's really serious. And you have countries like Afghanistan, where, again, it's so sad to see that there really was progress with women's education and women's role in society, which has just taken a nosedive. But it's not just in the Middle East. So this is just uh, last week um, in Florida. We have a serious contender for the White House who is trying to now push a ban on diversity programs in state colleges. So we've got to a situation where I have a strong sense that some of the very powerful people in society who are really having a large impact in driving our political forces, uh, a lot of money and, and a lot of influence internationally, are the patriarchy, as we used to say as old, are really pushing back against women having significant roles in science and elsewhere. And I dare say if Anne were with us today, she would be very concerned about this and think we should be taking action. So I don't have a, po I feel a bit like Cassandra after these wonderful positive <laughs> talks. Uh, I don't have a positive um, message for you at all. I have a, almost a sort of a warning that I think we, we need to work hard to defend what we have gained because it is really under severe threat. But I, I leave that as a matter for discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was fantastic. Great introduction. Um, so now we're just going to have a round of questions uh, for everyone that's here in the audience. We also will have online. And if it's OK, I would actually like to start with one. Uh, I would like to, uh, to start taking the quote that uh, you, Susan, have said that your mother said about that if she would have been a better scientist, she would have been a worse mother and the other way around and timing. So as a, as a female scientist myself and also specialized in reproduction, one thing that I always keep in mind is a topic of family, when to have a family. And obviously there is a biological clock that's the 35 years that we know about. Uh, and I still remember in my, when I did the master in clinical embryology, there was a teacher that said like, don't forget about it. If you really wanna go for it and wanna have a family, you need to start like burning mind at 35 years old. And now at 30, I look around and I think, okay, there is better policies to have a family. I think we um, have an advancement on how to promote women in science so they can stay in academia, allowing them to have the family matter. And I would like to hear about what do you think about how it has been improved and what else has to be done. But also as a reproductive scientist, I would like to know your thoughts about the fact that when she helped create the first IVF, she has actually given us a tool a tool of control in our time and it's then when we get to social prison and now many scientists are thinking well maybe I should consider the option of move to freeze my eggs and there is a bit of a translation into industry because industry can allow to pay for that but academia cannot so it's actually hindering the state of women and scientists because we can control and it's a choice 
So I would like to know your thoughts about that, ethically and also regulatory. Um, well, I'm happy to start off. Um, well, I think the situation we've got is a career structure that has been designed for men. And what we're trying to do is put women into it. And really, we need to you know, step back from that and start again and think about career structures that are for the next generation, because that's what we're all doing. What we're doing is for the next generation. What would that career structure look like? It would look very, very differently than it is at the moment. Mm -hmm. So I think often one has to, rather than think, one does have to tinker around one. And there's been good steps forward uh, in terms of shared parental leave, et cetera. There should be much more of that. Um, but I, I would just say, you know, we, we should have some kind of um, working group blueprint or, or something. I haven't seen it done, but the way they step back and they say, OK, we're going to design careers for the next generation. That means that it wouldn't be those who are carrying the babies that, let, you know, lost out in any way, because however, how all the good reforms that have been put in, they're, they're tinkering around the edges you know, women still lose out. And I don't know if people saw the statistics over the pandemic. I mean, that was scary. You know, the, the difference between women's publications and men's publications during and immediately after the, well, the pandemic's still going on, since the pandemic, large. And we don't have to think why, do we? Who was doing the homeschooling? Who was doing all those other things that needed to be done as ever? You know, so we, so it's a very big picture and it's a very broad canvas we need to work on to answer that. I just wanted to add one thing, which obviously um, childbearing is, is an issue where we need to redesign careers around it. But I think the other thing that's also really, really significant in terms of um, women's careers is caring for people towards the end of their life, which often falls much more towards female uh, members of the family. Um, and when you've got a social care system which is broken um, and on its knees, the amount of fa familial care that goes on and will go on in, even more in an ageing society is another dimension of this that we really have to think about. Yeah. Well, um, from the point of view of dialectical materialism, <laughs> um, we'd have to point out that, um, of course, a person would think about their fertility individually um, or in relation to a partner. Um, of course, a person would think about fertility in relation to a life, um, in relation to time. Um, but of course, fertility isn't really an individual thing. Um, fertility patterns are structural, and we know that. There's a discipline that studies that. It's called demography. and. Interestingly, one of the main factors that affects fertility is perception, you know, um, between your ears. And um, there are very dramatically changing perceptions of fertility uh, right now. So what we'd have to say is that people's consciousness about fertility is undergoing a very dramatic change very, very quickly. The demographers can't even model it. It's happening so quickly. Lots more people are thinking about not having children, not partnering, um, you know, all over the world, fertility rates are plummeting. Um, so this will drive consciousness change about the structural nature of fertility in a way that will require dramatic change. That's increasingly obvious and undeniable. Um, and of course, it comes across as an individual thing, but you know, um, probably characterizing that change structurally is one of the most important tasks for both social science and um, other fields of science, I would say, yeah. I would just say um, we need to also think about the role of men. So, um, you know, the, the, a lot of the successful female scientists I know um, have got partners who don't take the view that the woman has to do everything. And uh, I was very impressed by some of my male colleagues during lockdown who were really taking their share in things like homeschooling. So I think uh, men have to sort of step up if they really want this problem solved. Uh, but if the societal barriers prevent that and things like 
access to paternity leave or parental leave. Uh, there are countries where this is much better than other countries. And of course, the US is one of the worst in terms of parental leave for anybody at all. Um, and it just creates this incredible crisis for women who want to stay in science. So I think um, we, we need to think of both sides of that coin. And I, I have, I'm full of admiration for the men who have sort of stood up and said, yes, I think women are as important as men and, and made that difference. But I fear they are in the minority. There we go, the first one. Hello. Hi, my name is Isabel. I'm a leaf student in population health, and my research is about stillbirth in India. You see, during the pandemic and through social media, I learned that being a surrogacy in the US, you get a lot of income for being one. And I thought, I'm 24, and I still have a D fill to go through, so what am I going to do with this high peak fertility that I have? Maybe I should think about one. And the UK, I share really good regulation around it. And I realized, ah, oh, you know, I didn't know that it differs so much between countries. But it did worry me because my research is still birth. And we know that those who are socially disadvantaged are more likely to have complications and more likely to have, you know, adverse outcomes during pregnancy and also neonatal outcomes as well. So it made me realize. You know, what will Anne say about that somehow because of her amazing work that she did for women, by women, the IVF being successful, and now it's being used for somewhat unfortunate that mm, those who can afford to have surrogate mothers to have their babies tend to be quite socially disadvantaged and they have, they use it as a source of income. And I just thought, while I'm a, it's not a very biomedical topic, perhaps um, knowing that Anna was a very much someone who talks about public consultation, that it could be a good topic to just talk about um, within the panel. And thank you so much for the amazing speech today. Um, yeah. Um, so I think this is where having a, a broader social and ethical and political framework is really important. Um, and Jonathan or Callan, you can, you can uh, say differently. It's always, it's always problematic, isn't it, when you try and think about somebody who's no longer here, what they would have thought of. But my memory is that Anne was very clear about things that were technologies and that technologies can be used for ill and for huge benefit. And the extent to which that is the case depends on society and the way it's organised and who's making decisions for what purposes. Um, the, the issue about uh, certain people profiting um, from a technology that is there to help the well-being of individuals and th the population and groups really reflects the nature of um, the society we're in in that um, capitalist societies um, are very profit driven. And so things that should be public goods um, and technologies that benefit um, women being able to have children is hugely a public good has been commercialized. And I think um, I'm sure there are ethical frameworks around all of this. It's, you know, that it's not my expertise, but I think that's the bottom line that one has to you know, do two things. One is look and see within the society and the power structures that there are at the moment, how can things be made as good and as equitable as possible? Um, and that's where I think that Emily's mentioned of regulation and, and the, the, the role that that can play, but also recognise that in order to really achieve um, the, the use of technologies for the good of all, one needs to have very uh, fundamental economic and political changes in society. Any other questions? Oh, there at the back? Yeah. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Prenika. Uh, I'm a digital health professional uh, since last 10 years, uh, and I'm pursuing a master's in digital health here. And uh, 
One of the reasons I'm at Oxford is because of Susan. Uh, I've been following her work since I started to work in behavior change. So it's a great honor for me to uh, hear her and know about Anne. Um, and my question is about the gendered uh, imbalance in technology design. Um, uh, as a kid who was growing up in India, uh, I've always known about Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. But I never knew uh, the first computer programmer was Ada Lovelace. I never knew that the inventor of Wi-Fi was, uh, you know, uh, Hedy uh, Lamar. So, uh, and I also know that there is this uh, disruption in technology that we are living in, but there is also this gender imbalance in technology design, and uh, which is which has potential implications on us as a society. So. To all the esteemed panelists, I would like to have your, their perspective on how they see this and what can be done about it. I haven't got thoughts at the moment. Uh, well, that's a really terrific question. And um, yeah, that is a subject that's had a lot of research done on it. And one of the most difficult challenges is the way that the gender imbalance is literally built into the code. You know, it's so deeply built into some of the infrastructures of things like Wikipedia, you know, that you can't really undo it, you know, um, which, of course, is why there have to be, you know, more women and not just more women, but a much more diverse group of people involved in the development of new areas like AI. And we can see that debate happening right now. So I don't really think there's an answer to that question. I think that's a very astute diagnosis of the question. But I think drawing attention to that problem right now is hugely important. And sometimes that is what a more political approach to science involves, repeating an important point about who's at the table, what difference it makes that they're not at the table, and what we don't know as a result of their not being there, and what we're building into the future as a deficit of what we can know unless that problem is solved. Yeah, I'm happy to add a few words to that. Um, and I think broaden it out. So it's not just gender, but it's also many different um, ethnic and cultural and um, disadvantaged uh, communities that um, lose out as digital and other technologies are developed. And I think one really important concept is the concept of co-creation or co-production that technologies ought to be developed alongside all of those who are going to use it and who can potentially benefit from it. Too often, the technologies are being developed by one group of uh, privileged people um, for, for others, often with the best intention. But there are so many unintended consequences in what is a very complex landscape um, that right from the beginning, one should be having the communities that uh, will be able to inform and shape the way technologies are not only developed, but also the way they're disseminated, the way that um, engagement is thought about, you know, because different communities will engage different, differentially with different technologies. But this isn't really very often done. I mean, I, I was um, on the scientific advisory group in emergencies during the pandemic and um, specifically on the behavioral science group within it. So many times our advice to government was you need to consult with, you need to listen to, you need to engage the communities that these are policies are being developed for. And it's the same with technologies. But, you know, it does require political will behind it. But I, th I think that's key. And not coming in at the end and say, oh, we've got this technology. Now let's have some focus groups and some user testing and, and, and see what's going on. Make sure that the right people are there at the table right from the beginning. So we are obviously seeing the different gender difference in this, but we as women in science research or policy, what can we do? What have you seen in your experience or you saw in Anne McLaren of attitude that made a difference that you would recommend to a younger female scientist? Okay, next time don't look on the other way. Or I think the most common thing is now like men tend to apply for jobs when they only fulfill 50%, women apply when they fulfill 80%. Similarity? in research and policy, what would you recommend women to, to do? What's in our chance? Um, 
Yes, I, I think one of the points I, I was perhaps rather clumsily trying to make in what I presented was that quite often these biases are not because people are evil or wicked or anything like that, that there's a lot built in that has to do just with you form schemata that are based on the data available. And this is, of course, at the moment, a real concern with AI, is that it will have all the prejudices that we all have because it's bringing in on the same data. So what you have to do to change the prejudices is to change the data, of course. Um, and I've spoken to groups of women where you ask them, you know, would you, uh, I mean, it's great here, we've had questions from women, but very often in some situations where you give a talk, you know, even if there's more women there than men, the men put their hands up, the men are sort of asking questions, and the women have, uh, remain very quiet. There's this sort of, I think it, it goes together with the idea that it's not terribly feminine to push yourself forward, to sort of draw attention to yourself. And what I encourage women to do is to speak out, be bold, be brazen. You get used to it after a bit. A lot of women feel very uncomfortable doing that. But at the moment, if you, if you sort of are thinking, who will I invite to my conference or something, most of us will find that what pops up are the names of the people that have previously been invited. And they, if there's a bias there towards men, that's who you think of. You have to work hard to find women to think of. So you have to be more bold about making sure that you are represented in the data and that you aren't just hidden away because you're quietly sitting there waiting for somebody to notice you. Don't want to sound, make it sound like victim blaming. I'm not sort of making it sound as if you know, it's all women's fault that they don't get noticed. But I think there's an element where um, it ties in with the notion of what we think a typical good feminine person is like to not uh, draw attention to yourself and it goes back to the gendered cheese and the you know be it will be a sweet pink fluffy princess and not a sort of bold assertive male if we can change that um, i think gradually you would find that the, the database on which we're drawing our, our inferences would change enough that we would no longer have these prejudices but it's it's a lot it's in for the long haul and it's not a quick fix and meanwhile i think we have to consciously you know, be aware of the problem and try to distort the statistics in perhaps a, a rather more overt way. Sorry, that's a very complicated okay. answer. Um, so, yeah, three, three words spring to mind, skills, confidence and um, structure. Um, I used to be absolutely terrified of public speaking and I used to be really scared of um, even speaking in groups. And actually, when I was in Oxford, I forced myself to be uh, chair of our junior common room because it would mean that I had to speak out in a group of people. But I remember uh, talking to Anne about it and Anne gave me a tip that I subsequently handed on to my daughters, which is when you're in a room and you feel too scared to say something, get in early with a question, just a really simple question. And then you've heard your own voice. And once you've heard your own voice, you'll be more emboldened to say things later on. And that works, you know, so these little tips can help. Um, so I think that um, some, some skills, you know, teaching, teaching or exposing women to the kind of training. Um, and, and I'm not saying just women, because there are plenty of men who can really, really um, benefit from similar things. But I think training in terms of um, things like being able to have your voice heard, you know, in, in public. A lot of people find that difficult. And the confidence thing is, bit, is big. But, you know, one of the things we know from psychology is the importance of having graded mastery. You know, you start with small things and build on small successes. And over time, you know, you get, you get more confident. And coming back to dialectic, skills and confidence are sort of dialectically uh, interrelated. And then um, the issue that... Sarah mentioned about structure is, is so important. So just the way that things are, pe the way people chair meetings, the way that meetings are organized, etc. A lot of things can be done that bring in people, and not just women, but people who are uh, less confident um, about putting their voices forward, but often have a lot of very important and interesting things to say. Um. I was going to say something very brief. I think uh, one piece of advice I would have is find other women and support each other um, and take seriously your obligation to support other women. Um, so, for example, if you're quite a junior scientist, you might be supporting PhD students. But as you become more senior, there are lots of people you can support. And I think just taking that, I think Anne very much saw that as a really key part of, uh, of her role. And I think take it seriously, supporting other women. 
And I, th I think you were first, and then you were first. Hi, I'm Sean. I'm a molecular geneticist at the School of Pathology, uh, the Dunn School of Pathology, South Parks Road. And um, I've got more comments than questions, really. And the first is what you've just been talking about, that really it's behaviour that's kind of discriminated against rather than being woman or man. Because what I have seen in my department, if a man behaves like a woman, he will be treated like a woman. And um, I don't know what the answer is to this. Um, and I don't really know how you solve it. But this is very, very obvious. Um, the second thing is that one thing that would make a huge difference to women and to men with caring responsibilities is to have very good access to very good childcare, very close to your place of work. And this is something we should all be fighting for. And um, I had some uh, administrative responsibilities in my department and I tried to push this idea of having some kind of South, South Parks Road crash and shockingly I had quite a lot of pushback from senior women and this is another problem that we need to really address and try to overcome and th in the States there is not much uh, provision for uh, you know maternity leave and whatever but when I was postdoc in Rockefeller, we had a crash on site. And this meant that women could actually go and, and put their children in the crash and then come to work. And they were always very close. And I think this is something we, that really needs to, to happen and not just for women. <laughs> Next question. I'm feeling inspired to ask my question now, so thank you. Uh, I'm a master's student at the Department of Education, and I'm really interested in what you all said about knowledge translation and connecting that to the internet. And so I wanted to know what your thoughts were on how we can better leverage the internet to do knowledge translation around science and more specifically around IVF. Okay, I'm happy to say something. <laughs> um, I can't talk about IVF, uh, but a, a general um, thing I can say is about um, knowledge translation. One is about how we generate knowledge to begin with so that knowledge is more useful and usable to those who can uh, make use of it. Um, so again, I think going back to what I was talking about, the co-design uh, issue is when one's um, investing in research, and I think actually research funders are getting much better at this, the, the MRC, um, the Wellcome Trust are doing much more of this. When you apply for funding, actually within the funding, you have to say, what is the translational pathway? Um, so you have to think about it right from the beginning. And it means that people have to um, really build it in and also think about getting resources to do it. So it's not just, here's a, here's a, a scientific product, it's up, up to the world what they do with it. You actually have to think, think it through right from the beginning. I think that's really helpful as, as one way of um, ap approaching that. The other, I think, is um, ensuring that th there's lots of um, meetings where um, those who are going to, you know, knowledge users, if you want to call them that, and those generating the knowledge come together. So there's a lot of mutual understanding um, in, in the whole process. Um, so th those are two things that I would immediately think about. I don't know anything about IVF, but I, I can say something about the use of the internet to, to communicate simply because of, you know, I've been blogging and tweeting for a long time and using the internet in a way for science communication. Um, and what forced me to do it with my own science was going on the internet. I mean, I worked on children's language disorders, and when I Googled it, it was horrendous. I mean, the only people who were out there were people who were trying to sell something that was completely crazy and not supported by science. My idea at the time was that wouldn't you know that we needed some sort of videos or something on YouTube that were useful for um, 
you know, ex explaining to people about uh, the disorders. And it, 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 of course, this was the opposite to what you're saying. It was like, you know, sort of let's just do the academic thing and crunch it down without talking to the people who actually wanted the information. Um, and I got very good advice during this. I had some colleagues we worked with and had a sort of campaign, but the best advice came from an advertising agent of all people who was giving time uh, for free to our group um, to tell us how we should tackle this. And I was very alarmed because she said, well, you know, I said, well, I thought we might make a 20 minute video. And she laughed and said, you know, the, you know three minutes. <laughs> I can't say anything sensible in three minutes. And I think what we learned was that the whole medium is very, very different. You need to take advice and you need to get it right. But what is interesting is that being brief doesn't necessarily mean being unscientific. It's more like you have to have stages where each stage can lead to a more detailed account until you end up with something as detailed as a scientific paper. But you can have a three minute video, which is what most people will look at, which has the key points, but you know, unvarnished and, and not, no nuance. But you then link to something else where they can get PowerPoint presentations or something, and that can link to proper references or something. So you can have a whole trail uh, of varying in degree of sophistication and varying in degree of length um, to communicate with people robust scientifically evidenced information, but you have to do it in a completely different way from how we conventionally try and communicate science. And that, you know, and, and you have to talk to the people who you're trying to communicate with and realize what questions do they want answered. Um, I mean, that's a big question. <laughs> I'm glad you asked it. But I do think, you know, we saw how quickly things could change during COVID, all these things that you could never really do differently. Suddenly, it was possible to do them differently. Um, you know, and we saw how the internet could facilitate, um, you know, a completely different kind of classroom. Um, we saw how it could facilitate different kinds of research connections. So, I mean, I, I, I would say, I think what Dorothy said is exactly right, kind of jump in, you know, learn what you need to do, use the internet as an invitation to reinvent. I mean, this for your generation is a massive reinvention carnival, you know, and you're the ones who can take that opportunity and run with it. Literally, you can reinvent what you think the university should be. You know, you can reinvent how you organize and how you resist the things that are structurally wrong, you know, with the way the disciplines are organized and the way that knowledge is not being translated. And so I would say, you know, the way you can use the internet to bring about change is to use it as an engine of reinvention fearlessly and collectively to do what clearly needs to be done, which is to fix so many of the systems that really don't work for anyone, actually. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we need to leave now. We're at the end. I first, I would like to thank all the panelists for all what you say and your insight. It's been amazing. I also would like to thank the Oxford International Biomedical Center for organizing it and Kellogg College and especially Kellogg College for giving me the opportunity to chair this event. And, <laughs> and finally, well, as you can see, there are drinks at the back, so please enjoy them now. If you have any more questions, come and speak with us and we're going to be here until the dinner, so enjoy it.